let's jump quickly to um, the the CFAA specifically. Um, can you, can mm-hmm. you uh, quickly and briefly just, uh, I guess, give us an overview of uh, what it is and um, how it's being used against, I mean, it was most famously used uh, in uh, uh, the late uh, Aaron Swartz's case. Um, he was facing, what was it, I think 35 years in prison under the CFAA for mm-hmm. basically mm-hmm. Um, going into uh, MIT, um, MIT closet, connecting his laptop to their, uh, their network and, as- and accessing like a mass amount of uh, publicly accessible academic journals. And um, just amazing, 35 years for that. So, so what is this act and uh, what, is it, what does it say and how it's being, how's it being used against these people? Well, uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act originated uh, in roughly, 19, I think it was 1984, and, you know, before the Internet, before HTTP, you know, iPhones, iPads, you know, everything. And um, essentially it was designed to protect, you know, federally protected computers, you know, and uh, I think major economic institutions. And then slowly over time uh, gets amended. Um, and it does a number of things. The main thing uh, that your section that you're seeing in most of these prosecutions like Swartz and Arnheimer is it forbids unauthorized access to a protected computer. Like I said before, a protected computer is just anything with a microchip. The problem with it is that it doesn't define anywhere what unauthorized access is, means. And so you've got the courts all over the country you have different definitions of it. You know, some people are like, oh, just violating the terms of service of a you know, website means unauthorized access, which I think is an extremely dangerous interpretation uh, because everyone, then everyone's really committing a felony uh, every day. Um, but it's become like this tool of the DOJ for because it's so malleable and I think so so broad and 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 uh, vague for you know prosecuting anybody who essentially has done anything that they think is remotely wrong with the computer um, and I think it needs to be amended and, and there's uh, EFS is working on that a number of people are, are trying to get get the statute under control it's it's funny how um I, I've been reading um some of what EFF has put out on it and uh, especially uh, I mean today is the uh, seven year anniversary of Twitter being uh, launched and I, I found it interesting how they named off all these big names in tech and just innovation entrepreneurs who who could have been and would have been probably tried under this this act mm-hmm. if they were doing this today I mean Steve Jobs Bill Gates Mark Zuckerberg uh, Twitter founder Jack Dorsey just recently was talking about how he got his start hacking and again hacking is not necessarily uh, a, a bad term you could hack for good hack for bad you could just hack any product you could hack a product you own like like how you could hack a, an Xbox 360 you purchased to, to do something that to, that maybe it was not originally uh, meant to do in the operating system, but you have it, you know, playing files from your computer or something. It's just amazing to me how, yeah. how they're trying to just turn the term hacking into this amazingly negative term. I mean, the press and uh, people in general always had this, I guess, negative connotation of hacking. But what we're seeing in, in just recent years is just this complete, like, just... I can't even explain what they're doing with this. It's just they're just grabbing anybody who has any knowledge or savvy in computers and technology, and they're trying to just try them under this act. It seems like to me. Mm-hmm. I, I think uh, you know I said it before. I think hackers are the new communists for the DOJ. I think there's a lot of um, irrationality and fear out there uh, because people don't understand. You, you you know what's going on in the computer world. You, you know there seems there's a big disconnect. All, all sorts. Of, I get contacted by computer security researchers and even people like they're doing data mining for the financial services industry, freaking out about these prosecutions uh, because they just consider it to be just normal, um, you know, computer behavior. And so. Uh, you know, there's this big disconnect from the people who don't understand anything about the computers, the computer world, who are actually writing these laws, and then the people who actually work, uh, you know, in the computer world, um, who just, you know, think these prosecutions are insane. We, we were uh, joking in the office the other day about how, uh, you know, we, we remember there was a time when, you know, they would they would find a hacker like that, not like this at all, an actual hacker who actually, you know, found a, a flaw in a security system and broke in and was able to manage, uh, access this, you know, back-end management system and how they would find these people and they would, you know, use their savviness and their intelligence to, you know, they would cut a deal and use them. Like, what, what, happened, to, what happened to something like that where they would, you know, cut a, a reasonable deal with these people and what, did they just fill up all their their 
hacker job slots. I mean, I don't quite understand why they're yeah. they're per, per yeah. going full force on these people now when they used to, you know, at the very least offer them some sort of uh, reasonable deal. Yeah, and I think that's what the Chinese are doing with their hackers. I mean, you know, they're, they're that's a great all, point. All their hackers that's have, have really, really good government jobs. I think over there, um, and I, you know, and I, I think, you know, what you see with a lot of these people, like you mentioned, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, and you know, all our, you know, Swartz, all the great computer innovators. They, they, they do this stuff because it's part of their process where they're learning, um, you know, about computers and systems and whatnot. And I think it's a very fundamental to their ability to innovate. And I think if these prosecutions had been around, uh, you know, in the 70s, you wouldn't have Apple Computer, you wouldn't have Microsoft, and you would have had a, you know, a chunk of our GDP uh, wouldn't exist. So I think there's an economic harm in uh, mm-hmm. what's going on with these prosecutions that I think is bad for the country. The, the the weird thing about about all this happening just now to me too is and not so much weird but just hypocritical again and just 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 completely unbelievable that um just just the end of last year the Supreme Court uh, declined to uh, review a lower lower court ruling in a case that challenged uh, a Bush era law which is the the FISA Amendments Act which uh, basically retroactively uh-huh. uh, gave telecommunications firms like you know Verizon and AT and T that they gave them legal immunity. Uh, for performing wire, uh, warrantless wiretapping. I mean, how can you say that AT&T has the ability to just not not respect their customers' privacy, but an individual can't publicly a- access information that AT&T is using? I mean, that AT&T has made available because they don't respect their customers' privacy. No, I know. I, I think that's a good question, you know, and and I think that the you know it's disturbing that uh, they got that uh, you know grant of immunity for warrantless wiretapping on U.S. citizens. That's a, that's extremely disturbing. I, I just I just really want to try to drive home the point here to to listen to listeners that um I mean regardless of what you think about you know someone like like a Weave or a Matthew Keys or their you know their internet histories or whatever there, there's two things going on here I think that's important to drive home number one is that none of these cases are are, are hacking cases they're just not hackers and and that's yep. what they're basically being tried for to the full extent of the law and then number two is that is that these these laws are so so draconian that regardless of whether you think uh, any hacker is guilty or not guilty in their case, the 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 sentences they're being dealt do not fit the crimes that they're being accused of. Mm-hmm. And I, mm-hmm. I just want to I just want to I feel like those are the two important points here to drive home to people because I see you know a lot of people talking about uh, these two cases because they're the most recent but just hackers in general where you know oh they 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 deserve to be punished or whatnot and I think it's important mm-hmm. to to you know separate people who mm-hmm. actually do hacking from people who just discover this just like you or me could have discovered like what what Weave and his mm-hmm. uh, what his partner I'm sorry I forgot his name did basically uh, uh, Daniel Spiller yeah they, they, any one of us could have come across that. It was just a public HD, uh, URL. And with Matthew Keyes' case, I mean, that's that's not a hacking case. And in terms of him, I'm seeing just so much, you know, and we've too, just so much, you know, uh, negativity to their character. And I mean, you could think what you want, but I think it's, impor- again, important to drive home that, that one, these aren't hacking cases, but that, that's what they're being perceived as. And number two, that whatever you think their punishment should be, what they're being charged with just does not fit the crimes. <coughs> And I, I just want to thank yeah, you. Yeah, I agree. I, and, I, and the one thing I would add to that is that these laws are so broad and vague that um, they potentially encompass, uh, you know, computer behavior by, uh, by uh, criminalized computer behavior by thousands that thousands of Americans engage in every day. And the government historically always goes after the unpopular defendants first, you know. But mm-hmm. people should be concerned about these prosecutions because the law is so broad and so vague it invites arbitrary prosecution by the government. I mean, I mean, it's, it makes so much, I mean, especially in the Weave case to me, because I mean, if you or I came across this, this information they came across, I mean, maybe we wouldn't have the savvy to pull the information like they did, but, but we, people should know about this, that AT&T and other companies that you're paying money to and your customers are, are, are and you are customers of just care so little about your personal information and your privacy that they're willing to save a buck to just leave this information out there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to, uh, Tor yeah. Eklund, uh, I just want to. I'm sorry. Continue. If you have something else to say. Oh no, no, that's it. No, that's 
Tor, I just want to, uh, Tor Eklund, uh, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll be following the cases of uh, where, where Weave's case goes from here and uh, Matthew Keats' case, which is just beginning. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it.